South Asia is one of the most vibrant cultural areas on planet Earth. A cradle of civilization, it has long been a place where great nations rise, thrive and fall. The mighty Mughals, opulent Mauryas and sophisticated Guptas are just some examples of empires that have left their mark in the subcontinent. However, one period in the shared history of India and Pakistan that is paradoxically both well-known and mysterious is that of the Indus Valley Civilization, the oldest civilization of South Asia. Its massive and expertly planned cities with large public buildings have captured the imagination of modern historians and caused much debate among scholars about who the Indus people were. From their rise in the 3300s BCE to their decline in the 1300s BCE, the people of the Indus Valley produced a marvelous civilization that deserves our attention. What was the Indus River Valley civilization? What were its inhabitants like? What culture did they create? In this video, we will answer all these questions and more. This video is sponsored by our YouTube members and patrons who get two exclusive videos weekly, not available anywhere else for their kind support of our channel. You can join their ranks to watch more than 160 videos, including our series on the Pacific War, Punic Wars, Persian Wars, Spanish War of Succession, Russo-Japanese War, North African Campaign of World War II, History of Prussia, Italian Unification Wars, Risorgimento, Albigensian Crusades, and much more. Click the link in the description or pinned comment to get the exclusive videos, early access to all public videos, our schedule, wallpapers, access to a special Discord server where we're very active, and much more. Thanks for supporting us, we couldn't be doing it without your help. According to archaeological evidence, the Indus Valley civilization ranged throughout the northwestern regions of South Asia, with the majority of its artifacts found around the modern-day Indian regions of Rajasthan and Gujarat, as well as most of Pakistan. The region includes large urban centers, like the cities of Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro. The former is even used to name some of the periods of Indus history. Covering an area of around 1,260,000 square kilometers, the territories of the Indus River Valley civilization encompassed many natural biomes, from forests to deserts to grazelands. This diversity of climates would come to define the Indus Valley civilization, with its diverse inhabitants making use of their diverse ecology throughout their existence, through their clever agricultural practices like intercropping. The origins of the Indus River Valley culture seem to stem from earlier Stone Age cultures in the region, with the earliest being the Magar culture in the Balochistan region of Pakistan. This is where the first relatively large settlements emerged, which would eventually grow into the famous cities of the Indus Valley. However, this focus on cities ignores an important fact that recent scholars like Danica Parikh have highlighted that the overwhelming majority of Indus inhabitants lived in rural areas, even at the height of urbanization. The rise of the Magar culture at around 7000 BCE, as well as other centers like Kot Digi, continued slowly for a few thousand years, as trade and irrigation increased the size of towns into large cities, which coexisted with nomadic and village populations. By the 5000s BCE, Large cultural regions with their own styles of pottery had emerged in northwest South Asia, which would form the nuclei of the major cities the culture was known for. This is called the regionalization period, where some settlements grew in size and became towns, building trade networks with regional villages. This led to what archaeologists call craft specialization, where distinct occupations of people focus on things like pottery making or bead making, and a more complex economy develops. This is in contrast with previous periods, where there was little focus on highly specialized crafts in the villages, and people likely did a little bit of everything. This was mostly a large settlement phenomenon. Small villages likely continued life as prior, just with trade with the regional centers. Eventually, around 3300 BCE, these larger settlements developed into major urban centers. This heralded the beginning of what scholars call the early Harappan period, which is where the Indus River Valley civilization takes on its most recognizable form. At the outset of the early Harappan period, the large cities the Indus is known for came into form and included large artisan districts that produced the material culture for which the Indus is known. These urban centers were relatively far away from each other, but were economically and culturally interconnected with one another. Major cities within the Indus River Valley civilization included Harappan, Mohenjo-Daro, Rakigahi, Ganeriwala, and Dolavira. These metropolises are what made the Indus famous in the early 20th century, 
when the first excavations by British colonial archaeologists first unearthed these magnificent complexes. Beyond the Indus's most prominent cities, many smaller villages also thrived as vibrant centers of craftsmanship. The early Harappan period seems to be one of consolidation, with the largest cities building various quarters for specialized craftspeople and integrating their regional trade networks into one large unified area. This era also featured an increasing homogenization of the style of the artifacts within the Indus River Valley cultural zone and saw an exponential growth in their production. The early Harappan period was followed by the mature Harappan period from 2600 BCE to 1900 BCE. During this period, the Indus reached its economic apex, producing treasures of great value made of beads, terracotta, and most importantly, lapis lazuli. Whoever the Indus people were, they appeared during the mature Harappan period as an industrious civilization, determined to expand the Indus culture and to gain access to more resources for construction and more crafts. So large was this growth that ancient sources in faraway Mesopotamia speak of the region as Maluha, a large and wealthy kingdom to the east that many scholars consider to have been the Indus Valley. The Indus was a Bronze Age industrial heartland, with thousands of craftspeople producing luxuries on a grand scale and exporting them thousands of kilometers away to lands like the aforementioned Mesopotamia. This growth appears contradictory in many respects. Places like Shortigai and Gujarat have their regional identities apparently erased, but a lot of other regions that were already part of the Indus appear to have been remarkably peaceful. Thus, there is a possibility that some parts of the Indus were colonized by force, but we cannot be sure. The mature Harappan period was truly an age of innovation for the Indus, a time when its nomadic, rural and urban components harmonized themselves in a triune symphony of cultural blossoming, mercantile magnificence and artistic eloquence. Having given a short overview of the little we know of the Indus Valley's long history, let us now take a step out from the flow of time and paint a picture of what life looked like in this ancient civilization, both in the rural villages and the larger cities. Life in the villages in the Bronze Age Indus was not that different from villages in South Asia today, defined by self-sufficient communities engaged in animal husbandry and agriculture. Studies by scholars like Cameron Petrie and Jennifer Bates have emphasized how some Indus Valley villages engaged in a form of agriculture known as intercropping. Intercropping is a method where farmers grow multiple crops at different stages of the year, while also leaving periods for the earth to grow nothing and rest for the replenishment of nutrients. This is a very sustainable and ecological practice, alluding to the fact that the ancient farmers of the Indus were just as innovative as the South Asian farmers of today, many of whom still use this same technique. Beyond farmers, ancient Indus peoples lived nomadic or semi-nomadic lives. Unfortunately, we know very little about these nomads, other than that they often served as transporters of important goods between villages and cities. Of course, the Indus River Valley civilization is most known for its major cities, and for good reasons. These cities were diverse, with many having unique structures that others did not. For example, Mahenjo-Daro featured a large citadel and a great bath, while Dulavira had a large port. Ancient Indus cities were often divided into large quarters, with these special districts likely having been dedicated to the housing of administrators or specialized craftsmen. In these sections, some bureaus, like the one in Harappa, which had a high concentration of seals, managed the production of various materials. These seals likely were used for bureaucratic purposes, like showing authenticity or ownership of products, a sort of made in Indus guarantee. Other districts were likely used by specialists to make specific artifacts, such as the beads and shell bangles characteristic of Indus archaeological sites, as well as pottery that the Indus people used for food. Ancient Indus cities also had something rather remarkable when compared to cities in Mesopotamia, large public buildings that anyone had access to. Whereas Mesopotamian and Egyptian cities had large monuments that only priestly and bureaucratic elites used, Indus monumental buildings were accessible to all and had public uses. Places like the aforementioned Great Bath of Mahenjo-Daro, which had an extensive drainage and watering system, were initially thought to be elite or ritual spaces. However, they were later discovered to be open to the public and used by at least part, if not all, of the city's urban population. In summary, cities in the Indus River Valley civilization were capable of receiving large amounts of raw materials from the surrounding regions, 
and then churning out endless quantities of beautiful craftsmanship that were sought all the way to Mesopotamia. Cities and villages during the mature Harappan period were interdependent, with the cities receiving surplus agriculture from the villages and sending finished goods out to them in return. The villages, however humble, were the foundation of Indus culture and life, and the grand cities were spaces with ample public grounds for people to recreate and meet each other. We will now move on to Indus long-distance trade, perhaps one of the culture's most remarkable achievements. The Indus Valley civilization had many large trade networks within it, with production centers in places like Shortigai producing priceless materials like lapis lazuli. These materials entered larger settlements, where they were made into new artifacts, and then exchanged throughout the vast expanse of the Indus cultural sphere and beyond. Indeed, Indus artifacts spread beyond their cultural homeland, traveling from the Gangetic Plains to Mesopotamia. To properly contextualize just how vast the Bronze Age Indian trade network was, let us take a trip with a hypothetical Indus seafarer to see how it unfolded. This trader has amassed his ship with goods from all over the Indus cultural sphere. Shell bangles from Dolavira, beads from Mahenjo Daro, and lapis lazuli from Harappa. He has sailed to many lands, and now he is making his final journey. At the bow he makes a stand, and west is where he goes. He begins his trip when the monsoon winds blow west, sailing from the Indus city of Dolavira to the coasts of modern-day Iran, stopping at various small towns. Eventually the Persian Gulf appears and he makes his stop to trade and exchange goods there. He winters in the region as he waits for the monsoon winds to turn, staying in the Indus quarters of the host city where many of his fellow traders from his home country have gathered. He then sails back towards the Indus Valley filled with goods from the west. The hypothetical story of the hypothetical sailor depicts a general idea of how the Indus Valley exchanged cultural ideas with the rest of the world. In fact, the Persian Gulf was culturally influenced by the Indus through this trade in very unexpected ways. The small Bronze Age state of Dilmun in modern-day Bahrain was a major recipient of Indus art and goods, and this impacted their administration. Due to heavy Indus influences, the elites of Dilmun developed state seals that were an aesthetic blending of square Indus seals and cylindrical Mesopotamian seals. In the site of Tel Abrak, in the modern-day United Arab Emirates, a mass of Indus goods, such as large pottery vessels, has been found. A similar picture appears in the site of Masya in modern-day Oman. Even more remarkably, there appears to be a section of that ancient Arabian city where Indus material culture and burial practices seem to have predominated. This could have been due to situations like the story of our hypothetical sailor, where seasonal traders from the Indus stayed in the city temporarily to avoid monsoons. Alternatively, it could represent a permanent population of Indus people residing in Oman, spreading their culture and tradition to the locals. We will now discuss Indus lifestyle and culture, which are elusive to us due to the lack of textual sources. One of the early excavators of the Indus, Sir John Marshall, considered the Indus to be an egalitarian society without leaders, due to the large houses in Harappa all being of similar sizes. Another early colonial excavator, Sir Mortimer Wheeler, believed, in contrast, that the two cities of Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa were centers of a highly centralized state, with two leadership figures, as he thought the large buildings were restricted to elites and resembled palaces in function. The debate has continued to this day, with scholars like Adam Green and Cameron Petrie arguing the former, and intellectuals like Massimo Vidali arguing the latter. What we can say is that very few burials in the Indus have any sort of elite artifacts in them, and are generally egalitarian, suggesting that class divides and severe social stratification were not prevalent in the Indus civilization, and that people enjoyed broad equality. In addition, the overwhelming majority of Indus denizens lived not in cities but in small villages, where life seemed to be largely egalitarian. The Indus River Valley's still undeciphered writing system is also worth bringing up. In the archaeological record, this mysterious script usually appears in small sections on seals and some inscriptions. To this day, academics have yet to determine what these symbols mean, with some scholars even questioning whether they represent a formal writing system at all. The Indus religion and how it was practiced is also unknown to us. Some clues exist in Indus seals, which show a man sitting cross-legged and holding back a bull and a tiger. This man has been interpreted as Shiva, a god from later Hinduism. However, this is unlikely as Shiva as a deity only appeared in the early common era, 
well after the disappearance of the Bronze Age Indus River Valley civilization. Many statuettes and terracotta figures appear in Indus cities and may have had votive purposes, suggesting some sort of naturalistic cult due to their exaggerated features, indicating fertility. The Great Bath may also have had a ritual purpose, but this is very difficult to prove. Another point of debate is whether the Indus was a peaceful society. Archaeologists have uncovered both tools that can be used in fighting and weapons in the region, casting doubt on initial theories that the Indus people were entirely pacifist. However, the supposed weapons of war are not that widespread and only appear in cities. As such, it may be the case that they were hardly ever used and that the Indus Valley civilization was able to manage its affairs with relative peace. The image we get from the Indus is mysterious and murky, but this large, expansive culture was likely a decentralized and largely calm civilization. With the end of the mature Harappan period, the Indus Valley seems to have entered a period of decline. The so-called Late Harappan period, from 1900 to 1300 BCE, was a period of apparently slow de-urbanization. This is not a uniform process, as many urban centers were abandoned very gradually with parts of cities falling out of use, while others continued to be inhabited. Many theories abound about this decline, on which we actually wrote our earliest members-only video. We will provide a short overview of the theories here. One theory is the so-called Aryan invasion, in which Indo-European-speaking peoples seemingly invaded and conquered the region, bringing forth the Vedic Age. While some massacre sites, such as one at the gates of Mohenjo-Daro, do appear in the archaeological record, there is no evidence of large-scale destruction in the region. Thus, the Aryan invasion seems to be the most unlikely of the theories involving the decline of ancient Indus civilizations. Climate change is another possible cause, as some ice core analysis shows drastic changes in climate during the late Harappan period. These climatic changes do not fully match the period of decline, as habitation of large urban centers continues a few centuries after the shift in weather. However, it does seem that climate change played some role in the downfall of the Indus civilization, even if many of the Indus civilization's villages appear to have adapted and thrived, despite the ecological challenges facing them. It is thus likely that during this period of climate change, urban dwellers moved to villages to continue living their lives after their cities had become unproductive places. By 1300 BCE, the Indus Valley had fully declined and the region remained predominantly rural until the end of the Iron Age, at around 800 to 700 BCE. With the end of the Indus Valley civilization, the region of South Asia continued its travel through history. Eventually, the second urbanization wave would hit the northwest and Gangetic valleys, leading to the rise of regional states, characterized by Brahmins, Buddhists, Jains, and Ajivikas. We have yet to resolve the mystery of who the Indus Valley people were, but we have learned many exciting things about them. We have discovered that they were advanced in agriculture and industry in ways that rivaled civilizations from thousands of years after their time. We have found that they partook in long-distance trade and magnificent cultural exchange with Mesopotamia and the rest of India. Finally, we have found compelling evidence of what was possibly a large-scale, egalitarian, peaceful society. The Indus Valley's contribution to world history is that of an example of a society which withstood large climatic changes and also appears to have managed to produce incredible industry while allowing much autonomy to its inhabitants. When you visit the cities of Mohenjo-Daro, Harappa, and Dolavira, you are visiting one of the most fascinating civilizations in the world. More videos on the ancient Bronze Age civilizations of the world are on the way. If you don't want to miss that and many other historical videos, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. Recently, we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.